Hey, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in to Recruiting Insight. This is the place to be if you want to connect with the most successful recruiters, hiring managers, and innovators in the real estate industry. Hey, it's a great day to recruit, and thanks for joining us as we kick off our fall season of Recruiting Insight podcast. And we're going to start with a bang today because we have Rick Davidson in the virtual studio. I know many of you know Rick because of his long tenure of success in the real estate industry. For those of you who don't know him, he's the founder and CEO of Karen Real Estate Holdings. Karen's a nationwide real estate investment firm that's focused on building a network of industry-leading companies and professionals. They currently operate in more than 70 locations, have more than 4,000 agents, and they completed 30,000 transactions last year. And honestly, they're just getting started. Prior to starting Karen, Rick was the global CEO of Century 21 for seven years. In this role, he was responsible for the health and well-being of a network that spanned 80 countries, had 8,000 offices, and 125,000 sales professionals. Oh yeah, at the same time, he served as the chairman of Easter Seals, the largest health services charity in America, which cares for 1.6 million individuals each year. As you might have guessed, none of these achievements happen without all types of individuals getting behind an inspiring vision and working towards something bigger than one person could possibly achieve. Isn't that the essence of recruiting? Well, I think it is. So let's jump in and see what we can learn from Rick's achievements. Uh, well, hey, Rick, thanks so much for joining us uh, this morning. It's, it's great to connect with you again. And I know many of our listeners are going to be uh, excited to learn uh, and learn from us some of the things that you've learned from being part of some of the largest and uh, most progressive real estate uh, organizations in the country. So uh, uh, just to get started, what, uh, what have you been up to for the last 15 years in the professional side? Well, 15 years. Well, I'm uh, 35 years now in uh, 34 years. I don't, I don't want to age myself too much. Uh, in the uh, real estate industry, 20 years uh, was spent exclusively uh, in the commercial real estate sector. And uh, I was in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan market for uh, the vast majority of that 20 years. And uh, so for since 2009 was really my first foray uh, into the residential real estate space uh, as the chief operating officer for Cobal Banker uh, Real Estate uh, on a global level. And um, Then in 2010, early 2010, I took the helm uh, of Century 21 globally uh, and was in that uh, role uh, for seven and a half years till mid-2017. And I saw an opportunity uh, that, you know, we really saw as a result of the downturn, uh, the, you know, the Great Recession, uh, where there was a lot of uh, aging uh, broker owners that were looking for succession opportunity. Uh, failed to execute on that succession in the up years of, you know, call it 2004, five and six. Uh, and now coming out on the back end of the recession uh, that was beginning to heat up. Uh, so, uh, you know, over the course of uh, the last few years, 2019, uh, I've put together a partnership between uh, myself and a relatively small management team and in a private equity group. Uh, and we're uh, executing on a buy-build uh, consolidation strategy uh, in the residential real estate space, not specifically just brokerage companies, uh, but brokerage companies and you know, formulating what I would call an ecosystem of consumer-related ancillary services. Uh, and uh, that's really where I'm spending uh, all of my time today and uh, excited about what the future holds. Yeah, I, I've uh, I've heard a lot about Karen, and uh, which is of course this company that uh, you started in 2019, and uh, and we're gonna uh, there's some exciting stuff you guys are doing. Um, just looking back a little bit, uh, um, you've you've led organizations during, during difficult times, and you've led uh, during uh, during good times. How would you contrast those two? Uh, what what do you what do you learn as a leader during good times versus what you learn in uh, in more uh, prosperous times? You know, I, I think there's a lot more learnings that come uh, in down cycles. Uh, you know, when things are good and revenue covers up, uh, you know, issues. Uh, not that you don't have to be good and not that you don't have to be smart, uh, but it's uh, it's not quite uh, as, as challenging. You know, down cycles are always tough on our people, um, especially when, like we're seeing today, a lot of news of staffing cuts and other negative headlines. Uh, of course, you know, all of the journalists are looking to grab readers. Um, so the headlines are you know, usually pretty dark. Uh, and this is a time when leadership is critical. Um, staying close to people, 
communication and transparency are critical uh, in these times. And you know, while culturally, uh, as a result of COVID, there has been a fairly significant shift in terms of office environment. Uh, I'm still a big believer in MBWA, which is management by walking around. Uh, and you know, even if our team members are remote, um, we can still have a similar impact by, you know, picking up the phone and checking on our teams, having Zoom calls, uh, getting together uh, on an ad hoc basis uh, in the market. Maybe it's just a networking event. But you know, the key is that people, you know, really want to know that you've got their back. Uh, they really want to know that you care about them. Uh, and about their families and about their future. Uh, so, you know, down cycles always present, you know, a different kind of challenge. Uh, but when you come out of a down cycle, um, I really feel as though you, if you've taken advantage of it, you've been afforded an opportunity to galvanize an organization. And that's really where we're focused today. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective. Um, so, would you, how, let's let's cut through some of the some of the media here, and I agree with you. It seems like uh, you know the clickbait stuff is what gets readers, and uh, you know I think if we just took everything and cut it in half, you might get somewhere close to reality. But but uh, how do you compare what's what's going on right now versus like you know the downturn in two thousand eight uh, two thousand nine? How, how would you compare the two? Well, I mean, certainly significant. Um, you know, drivers uh, of what's going on today versus, you know, what went on in 2008. 2008 primarily was tied to uh, a very loose, uh, you know, policy related to mortgages uh, and the ability to be able to qualify for mortgages. Uh, and, you know, that came back to, you know, bite the broader market. And it wasn't just real estate. It had, it had an economic impact globally. Um, and, you know, to sum it up today, in a, you know, frankly, a single word is uncertainty. Um, but, you know, in the real estate business, uncertainty drives inaction and inaction results in fewer home sales. Um, you know, when you look at the multitude of factors that are impacting houses, and I won't name them all, but, you know, there, there's a few that, you know, immediately for me come to mind uh, that are impacting the market today. Um, number one is affordability, uh, both in, and this is both in terms of price appreciation uh, and the rise in mortgage rates. Uh, the next would be, you know, the macroeconomics. Um, what's interesting about this market is, you know, the job market uh, overall and wage growth, uh, quite frankly, over the past year have been very strong. Uh, however, as we have all experienced, inflation has had a significant impact on the consumer's wallet. Uh, and, you know, the Fed's interest rate increases and, you know, of course, Chairman Powell, uh, you know, spoke again this morning. Uh, and, you know, has committed to, uh, you know, a, a very definitive approach uh, to the way that the, you know, the Fed is going to use interest rate rise uh, as a way of governing the economy. Um, but, you know, that that is meant to suppress inflation. Uh, but today it really hasn't had the impact that they're hoping for, which, you know, there's a basically a 2% inflation rate target uh, that, you know, the Fed is shooting for. And as such, I think as a result of that, we're headed for, you know, likely another 75 basis point rise in the Fed funds rate. That leads to really the third um, impact that I think that, uh, you know, what's going on today is having on, on the housing market. And that's a misunderstanding uh, that I believe that the general consumer's understanding of kind of broader economics and what's read on the front page of the USA Today uh, is really where their knowledge base is, right? You know, the general consumer really isn't spending time trying to understand the overall economy. They're really spending time making a decision about, hey, how do I feel about my pocketbook and what do we need to do as a family, uh, you know, in order to, uh, you know, continue with our, our existing lifestyle. So, you know, that view that those consumers have is this kind of very high simplistic overview, um, you know, with editorial commentary that comes from the journalists which is never providing a, a comprehensive understanding of actually what's happening in the economy. And so as such, the consumer really gets caught up in this editorial rhetoric uh, and generally has a misunderstanding of the broader housing market uh, in addition to the broader economy. And lastly, I would, I would say volatility. Um, you know, we have a lot of volatility uh, with macro geopolitical issues uh, and economies like, you know, Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, China's threat to Taiwan, 
the midterm elections here in the United States, you know, just are a few that immediately come top of mind. Uh, we've got volatility in the stock market. Uh, we've got pretty significant volatility in the bond market. And as a result of that, in the mortgage market. You know, the mortgage market uh, today, um, you know, rates are at about 5.7. Um, and the 10 year treasury is just above three. So the spread between the 10 year treasury and the mortgage rates right now is about 270 basis points, which, if you go back historically and look at the spread, we're about 100 basis points higher than the historic spread of, of mortgage rates above the 10 year treasury. So the mortgage market um, you know, has everything to do with mortgage backed securities uh, and you know, the interest in mortgage backed securities on, on Wall Street. Uh, and as a result, there's been you know, just a lot of volatility in the bond market and hence the mortgage market. So it's really hard to determine what's coming next. And this volatility creates uncertainty for the consumer. And you know, as I said at the top of, of your show, you know, uncertainty drives in action. Um, the reality, this, and this is what's so interesting about the market today, is that the reality is that we really have a healthy residential real estate market. There's a lot of interest in home ownership. In fact, home buyer demand, while it is down 12% on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, where we, in comparison to where we were in August of 2020, uh, you know, millennials and home buyers. Uh, are the largest sector of our population and they're squarely in the home buying range. And we have inventory levels that are still significantly below historic norms for what I would call a normalized market. Uh, we're moving back from this, you know, hyper appreciation rate that we saw in late 2020, 2021, and even going into 2022. Uh, you know, we still have a very strong job market. And I believe that if it weren't for the affordability factor being again, combination of price and current mortgage rates, that we would have a really solid market for the foreseeable future. But it's, it's, it's all of these things that are coming together and kind of, you know, hate to use the analogy or the term, a perfect storm, but that's really what it feels like. Yeah, I hear you. So, so what, what I hear in that in that in that in that dialogue is that this uncertainty is really what drives a lot of the the hesitancy to do things, and I think that uncertainty is going to roll down into how you run a, a real estate organization as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and that makes it difficult. And as a leader, I think um, to to hear some of your experience about that and some of the tactics that you take in those difficult times will be super super helpful. So let's drill into recruiting a little bit. Uh, so as a, as a leader, and, you, and you've led organizations that have just had to recruit a ton in order to be successful. So as a leader, uh, what are some of the tactics that you use uh, during difficult times uh, versus the tactic recruiting tactics that you use during, during better times? So, you know, not unlike any industry, um, you know, where you're engaging entrepreneurs who live a eat what you kill uh, lifestyle. Uh, there are always going to be those who excel and, uh, and those who find uh, the stress and difficulty in such a career. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, of hiring, you know, agents at every level, uh, provided that they represent your company and other professionals who are part of your company with integrity and the highest level of service in the marketplace. Um, so, you know, what, what recruiting really comes down to for me is understanding what an individual agent is looking for. Uh, really getting into having a conversation with them about what's important to them. Uh, you know, are they having challenges in the marketplace today? Uh, what are those challenges? Where do they feel or find that they need uh, the greatest level of support? Um, you know, and, and what are they looking to accomplish, uh, you know, both professionally and personally? So what are their goals? What are their objectives? And really getting in and trying to understand who they are as professionals and who they are as people, what's important to them and then what they need in order to find that level of success. So, so would you say the tactics don't really change that much? So it sounds like, uh, you know, that's going to be a tactic when things are good and when things are bad both. Is that correct? Uh, without a doubt. Um, you know, it's, we, we, we only have a couple of levers to pull in this business. Um, and, you know, those levers that allow us to drive revenue as a brokerage uh, firm. And, you know, first and foremost is recruiting and retention. Uh, you know, next is improved productivity or PPP. 
Um, you can outperform the market as an organization and you can offset these market declines if you're highly effective uh, at recruiting and retaining agents. And so, you know, the if effective recruiting really requires us uh, to get in and to understand the agent, their goals and objectives, what they see as the roadblocks. The market cycles, frankly, don't matter um, as long as you take the time to under understand specific goals and objectives. So, so, and that's that, I think that's in, encouraging to he, to hear that uh, from any of the many of our listeners, uh, you know, who are in the recruiting space, do recruiting every uh, day in and day out. What, what I'm hearing you say is that most successful, progressive, uh, really organizations that are going to win during a downturn don't stop uh, recruiting; uh, they focus on retention and production as well. Is that a fair statement? Hey, look, you know, recruiting is the number one. Uh, it's the number one thing we have to do organizationally. Uh, and we have to focus on retention, you know, right behind recruiting. Uh, we all know that there's an attrition rate in this industry. Um, and we've got to be focused on that. So we have to constantly be focused on bringing really high quality professionals in the door that are going to represent our organization and the broader, uh, you know, community of our agents uh, with integrity and, and high levels of service. Uh, but those companies who stop focusing on recruiting, um, you know, if you're not recruiting, you're dying because recruiting in this business is breathing. Well, um, let's talk a little about uh, attrition here, uh, because I think it, it, with new agents, one of the patterns that we've noticed in the last couple of years when the when the COVID crisis happened, there was a lot of government money floating around. People were working remote. There was a huge influx of new agents into this industry. And uh, and I think we're finding out now as things get difficult, there's a good chance that some of those people are, are going to exit uh, and, and perhaps they even need to exit. So they they should, maybe shouldn't have come in in the first place. Are you finding that kind of attrition? Uh, it, when we go through a downturn is healthy for the, for the, for the industry. It's only healthy for the industry. If the professional is really not committed to the craft, um, you know, it's uh, you know, this is an industry that has a low barrier to entry. And as a result of that, unfortunately, you know, there are a lot of real estate agents. And I think that, you know, any of the listeners would attest to this uh, that really don't represent the industry. Well, and I think, you know, as leaders in this in this industry, um, you know, we we have to have the responsibility and take the responsibility uh, to ensure that we are organizationally and as an industry putting our best foot forward, uh, always putting forward, you know, agents that are really well trained, really understand the business, really understand how to serve a customer in the right way. Um, so, you know, those agents that come into this business that think that this is an easy business that they can do part time. Uh, and that really are not dedicated uh, to constant learning and development uh, and evolving uh, their you know, skill set as their experience base increases. Um, those are the kinds of you know, agents uh, that really, uh, they don't serve the industry well. And if they don't serve the industry well, they certainly won't serve our company well. Um, so, you know, yes, there's some level of, uh, of you know, health involved for the industry, as you see this attrition with agents that have come into the industry when the market is super hot and they think that they can jump in and make money and that it's relatively easy to do so. Um, at the same time, you know, if you look at uh, the average age of an agent uh, today at, at, you know, within NAR, uh, you know, they're 56 years old. Um, and, you know, so they're coming towards the end of their career. Well, what that means is, you know, in order to have the right number of agents to be able to serve the consumer base as we have uh, organizationally and, and as an industry, you have to constantly be bringing in new blood. And I think that um, I'm, I'm a big believer, frankly, in, in bringing on new agents uh, as long as uh, you have a great learning and education program. You have the time uh, to be able to spend with these agents, uh, to bring them along and to teach them how to do this business effectively. Uh, and uh, that you've got a great mentorship program um, where you've got you know, seasoned experience agents that are willing to spend time with these newer agents. Uh, and there's a lot of benefit and value in that for the broader organization or the industry as a whole, because they're gonna teach these newer agents how to be really effective in their craft. 
That's a great formula. And I think uh, um, one of the things I've noticed, uh, in fact, probably four or five of the folks that we've had on uh, on the podcast uh, in the in the last uh, season were were high performers, whether they were team leaders or broker owners or even individual agents who came in during the last downturn. They came in during 2009, 2010, and uh, and really cut their teeth uh, during some really difficult circumstances. And today, 10, you know, 10, 12 years later, they're they're the, they're the highest performing people in the industry. Do you think that brokerages have the same opportunity now to uh, really bring people in uh, a little more difficult situations and really teach them the craft in a way that they couldn't learn otherwise? Oh, I do for sure. Um, you know, it's, you know, when, when you get into uh, a market like we're in today and, you know, we talked about the headlines that we're seeing across the industry today and a lot of people are, you know, staff is being cut, et cetera. We have to be really careful um, organizationally uh, to not to cut into the muscle. Um, and the muscle to me is uh, kind of those core platform services that we provide to our customer and our customer being the agent. Um, we've got to be highly committed as an organization to provide a consistent level uh, and a high level uh, of education, masterminding, uh, training, uh, and otherwise uh, to both you know, our newer agents and our experienced agents. Um, and I really think that there's you know, a tremendous opportunity um, to help people uh, to continue to build and to grow regardless of what's happening with the market cycle and regardless of whether or not they're a new agent in the business, a medium agent or an experienced agent. You know, most experienced agents, uh, uh, you know, come to a brokerage, they've got a system, they've got a model, they've got technology uh, to successfully conduct their business. And, you know, that said, I think that these experienced agents really look to the firms that they're associated with. And, and I take this very seriously as a leader. Uh, they want us to have an eye towards the horizon. Uh, they want us to understand the trajectory of the industry. And, you know, um, Wayne Gretzky, um, you know, I always loved his quote. The reason that he said that he was the greatest hockey player to ever play the game is he scared you to where the puck was going to be. Right. So as leaders, we have to anticipate kind of the trajectory of what's happening, not just with the market, but with the industry as a whole. Uh, and we need to be able to consistently bring value to the table as a way of improving the business that even these experienced agents are doing. Uh, and that could simply be training and education. It could be technology, it could be services, it could be process, or it could be market data. Um, and, you know, they have their own formula for success, but it doesn't mean even the greatest agent, you know, as you well know, a lot of great agents uh, engage with coaches and they engage with coaches because they want a level of accountability and they want someone to help them to understand, you know, where are the roadblocks? Where are the trip hazards? And uh, and I take that very seriously as the leader of an organization with a lot of agents that we really need to be focused uh, on those agents, whether they're new, medium, or or highly experienced, and keeping our eye towards the horizon and the trajectory of the industry, and delivering back to them the things that we're seeing, and giving the benefit of that them the benefit of that wisdom. Yeah, that is, that is just, it's, it's so, it's such important work, uh, but it's, it's such hard work. It's, it's really hard uh, to pull that off as a leader in the, in the middle of the uncertainty, right? Uh, to be able to, uh, the, you know, Wayne Gretzky makes it sound simple, but it's not. It, that's why he was the greatest. He did it better than anyone else. Well, let's, let's focus a little bit more on experienced agent recruiting then. Uh, of course, uh, every, we have all these organizations out there that uh, hopefully are trying to do what you just talked about. Um, some of them are going to do it better than others. And, and uh, of course, when, when things don't work out in an organization or things get difficult, uh, anytime there's some sort of disruption that happens, whether in the broader market or even an individual company, then agents start to look around and, and appropriately. Uh, I love what Mark Johnson always says, you know, it's, it's all about the value. Uh, what value are you bringing to the table? So in this case, what kind of value propositions during, a, during difficult, challenging, uncertain times tend to resonate with those experienced agent recruiters? Recruit, uh, experienced agents who would be vulnerable to be recruited? You know, I, I got to be honest, I don't think it's any different than what we just discussed. Um, you know, we, we need to be really close to our people. Uh, we need to understand from them their approach, uh, the challenges that they're facing, uh, and we need to find ways to add value uh, one agent at a time. 
Um, you know, as leaders, we've got to anticipate the market, the industry. We've got to ensure that they are well positioned for success, regardless of the market performance. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think that is absolutely critical is we have to be consistent. We have to actively listen uh, to our people like, you know, not just the cursory. Hey, how are you? And I really didn't care. Um, and, uh, you know, and you're moving on just because you wanted to touch base. No, I'm talking about stop, spend time, spend 15 minutes talk to these agents about what's really going on with them. Uh, because even the most experienced agent is finding challenges in any market cycle, uh, whether it's you know the last cycle that we're just coming out of where they have 50 offers on one home uh, and they got to figure out who's the you know horse that they want to ride uh, to the closing table. Um, or it's a market like we're in today where a lot of top agents, you know, production is off 30, 40, 50%. Um, and, it, you know, it's a combination of the affordability factor, mortgage rates, price appreciation, uh, or it's just, you know, lack of inventory. Um, so there's always a challenge to be had. It's really important for us to stay close to our agents, that personal touch, more of that management by walking around, uh, whether that's on the phone, on a Zoom, in an office, uh, at a networking event, and really understanding from them what they need in order to help them to find solutions. So, so would you say that um, and, and that there are certain uh, uh, models or certain types of companies that are, are better equipped in this environment to do that, or is it just really boil down to the leader uh, at the individual level uh, or even at the company level? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, Karen Real Estate Holdings, uh, you know, we are we are an organization that's acquiring firms, and we are brand agnostic and model agnostic. So we happen to own, you know, companies in both a traditional model, uh, you know, normal split, more office centric culture uh, versus a transaction model that is more remote, even though we have a high level of services that we provide in that transaction model, it's it's pretty much a remote model, right? We don't have offices where you've got an office manager and you're, you know, having conversation on a day to day basis. I think you can be effective in both. Um, and I I think that there's, uh, you know, agents that will find success in either of those uh, models. It's just what's most important to that agent. And if they're finding uh, that they're having a tough time, you know, getting what they need, you really have to dig in. You got to say, OK, so I understand that, you know, you're not getting what you think that you need from an organizational perspective. What is it specifically that you need? And then you kind of, you know, marry their specific needs to the value proposition that you bring to the table. And maybe it's just simply, you know, clearing the field and getting them to see, uh, wow, okay, now I can make the correlation between the challenge that I've had and what we actually provide uh, as a company. It doesn't have to be uh, an office-based environment versus a remote-based environment. You know, you don't have to look past, uh, you know, the success of, you know, a, a, a traditional firm that has uh, a heavy office culture versus, you know, a hundred percent remote uh, organization and the successes that both of them can have in any market cycle. So, so it sounds like the common thread there that I see between all of that is, and it kind of relates back to what you said at the beginning, you, you during the downturns or during the difficult or uncertain times, you've got to get close to your people. You, and whether that, it doesn't, it is model specific, but it sounds like that's really the, the, the theme here with retention is, is uh, being there, whether it's through coaching, through, through these other things, but it really seems to be the theme. Am, am I catching that? Absolutely. Um, without a doubt. Being close to your people, really listening to them, uh, understanding what challenges that they're facing, and it might be professionally or personally. Uh, you know, 50% of the people that you talk to on any given day are going through one of the most dramatic life experiences uh, that they've had to date. And you know, a lot of people don't talk about it, but a lot of people want to talk about it. And if you if you create that opportunity. Uh, you can have those personal kind of conversations and you can have tremendous breakthroughs uh, with people by having that kind of conversation. People want to know that you care, that you care about them, uh, that you care about their families, that you care about their success and their future. And, you know, the, as, as, the, as the market cycles and as things get a little bit tougher uh, for, you know, people on the front line uh, who live this eat what you kill lifestyle, um, staying close to them, letting them know that you are supporting them in every way possible and 
you know, you really are uh, there to lift them up uh, and to help them to be successful in the market, regardless of what's happening with the market. The most critical uh, component of uh, of retention, and frankly, recruiting. Yeah, no, I hear it. I hear it. Uh, that theme just is so important. Well, let me ask you one final question. I ask this to pretty much everyone that's on the podcast because there's a lot of uh, a lot of the people who listen are, are team leaders, individual uh, broker owners that, you know, they run organizations that are 10, 20, 30 people. Um, if you were in the, that role, uh, what to, what is it? What one thing would you be focusing on more than anything else at this point you know, during I view myself in that role uh, every day. Um, you know, I may just I, I sit in a different seat, um, but at the end of the day, it's all about uh, you know the KPIs that really drive our business. Uh, going back again to the two primary levers that we can pull uh, is recruiting and retention and per person productivity. Um, so you know, being focused on recruiting, retention, and productivity uh, is the number one priority. Uh, when market shifts, you know, agents are looking for guidance. Uh, we've got to keep them highly engaged. We've got to provide training and education. We have to make sure that they understand how to approach specific market dynamics. We've got to keep our people market smart uh, so that they can effectively articulate the market performance. Uh, and more importantly, you know why the market is performing the way that it is and what they can do for their clients to keep their clients ahead of the curve uh, to be able to effectively serve their customer. So, you know, it really comes down this, you know, this is not an easy business, but it's a very simple business. Um, And it's about attracting and retaining really good people. It's about ensuring that they are trained up to be the absolute best that they possibly can be. It's about creating an environment where people are open and willing to share their successes in order to help the greater good. Uh, and in that process, especially when you go through a market cycle like we're you know, experiencing today, you have this opportunity to galvanize an organization. And if you want to get, if you want to take an organization, whether it's a team, whether it's an office, whether it's a brokerage or something even greater, you have to galvanize the entire organization around the common vision. Uh, you have to, you know, you, you, you have to be consistent in your communication as to what your expectation is and where the organization is headed. And you got to be checking back with your people on an absolute daily basis, if not more frequent than that, to make sure that they have everything that they need in order to help to drive the greater good to that level of success that you're all looking for. That's a, that's a great summary of how to, how to run a real estate organization. So, uh, well, Rick, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've learned a lot from uh, from what you shared today. It's, a, it's really a privilege to be able to spend time with you uh, just uh, in, in gain from the experience that you have. Now, to all the, those of you that are doing the hard work of recruiting every single day, take what you've learned today and go make a difference. Mm-hmm.